second song. It's JP Before I Forget. <laughs> Forgive me, JP. I don't know what time it's on, but I'll get it on the page for this show. You're back to the second hour of The Velocity of Now. I'm your host, Thomas Sheridan. My website is www.thomasheridanarts.com. Hundreds of pages of information, hundreds of hours of video, all useful, all entertaining, lots of fun. And if you want to help me continue this because I've been had. A lot of trouble with cyber attacks and I had to buy software and it's also broadband and other things. It's just, it's, it's just, you know, I know the truth should be free, but administration isn't. It's just as simple as that. So if you want to buy a book, you can get links to my books there. If you want to throw me a few quid through the donate button, I'd love that as well. And thank you to all the people who've done that so far. This is the Velocity of Now on the Type 1 Radio Network. Now, while that sweet, sweet tune was playing by JP... I was, uh, I, I, and I was, beforehand, before the break, I was talking about 
Jeff Foxworthy, very clever American comedian with it. You might be a redneck if, and then I was speaking with a cult members uh, during JP's song, I just wrote down a, a routine, sort of, you know, a, a spin on the JP, oh, sorry, not JP, on the Jeff Foxworthy uh, skit as it was, as it is. And uh, it's, it's, let me see if it works. It might not be that funny, but I just, I just quickly scribbled these down, okay? If your idea of channel surfing is your leader on a surfboard, then you just might be a cult member. If the term family to you means you and a group of people you are not related to burying a body in the woods, then you just might be a cult member. If you've tried to use a tinfoil hat as a capital investment tax write-off, then you just might be a cult member. If the end of the world is an arbitrary target and subject to change at a moment's notice, then you just might be a cult member. If your leader has more enemies than James Bond, then you just might be a cult member. And finally, I promise this is the last one. If your concept of a good neighbor are beings on another planet in a different galaxy and not the bloke next door, then you just might be a cult member. Anyway, that was my uh, tragic attempt at Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy. Now, we're in the second hour here, and uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, I do know what I'm going to do. We're going to have a uh, fight chick in the last half an hour come in and talk to me. But i tell you something. I've been reading this other book. I know I'm, I'm always reading, but I'm just reading the other one I'm reading. This is the glorious days of, uh, of book collecting because you can... You can just get books so amazing books so inexpensively now, you know, for a fifty cent or a euro because everyone's going onto the Kindle Fire and all that crap. But um, I got this book called Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Nine Lives Under the Nazis, and it's basically the book basically talks about ordinary people living under the National Socialism in the nineteen thirties, and and then later on when it, you know when the war started, and just just regular folks, you know, and. Uh, what struck me about it, it's actually, there's a BBC documentary, but no, it wasn't, sorry, I'm thinking something else. And it says, a series of striking, extraordinary, well-written life stories, they are often monstrous, but about their authenticity, there can be no doubt. Harold Nichols, the observer. Now, I haven't got deep into it yet, so I've just got, I'm just getting into the, you know, how the Nazis, when it began, how national socialism began, how it affected ordinary Germans. When Louis Hagen returned to Berlin immediately after the war, having survived not only the incarceration and torture in a German concentration camp, but also the Battle of Arnheim, it was true a desire to see the great German eagle topple, its talons drawn, that the son of a wealthy Jewish banker, he had, he had seen his family flee their home, and many of his relatives had died at the hands of the Third Reich. He wanted to understand the German people, why so many had welcomed the Nazi party, and were they now humble and wiser. Hagen, Hagen, sorry, interviewed nine people he had known before the war who represented a wide spectrum of German society. There was an SA officer, a businessman, a doctor, a socialite, a journalist, and a professional soldier, an SS wife, a member of the Hitler Youth, and a person who was half Jewish. Four of the Nazis, three, four of them, four were Nazis and three were collaborators and two were anti-Nazi. The very fact that none of these people were was a high-ranking Nazi official or a survivor of the Holocaust, provides an insight into the Third Reich that a revelation even with those who know this period of history intimately. How could the Baroness sent to the concentration camp hold salons for the ex-Nazis after the war? And what this book tells you is that it goes into the German psychosis. You see, th these things don't happen instantaneously. We're made to believe that revolutions and all these kinds of things happened, but it was drip feed, and people were in Germany were put in a position where they were, you know, after the, the after World War One, and they were put under just tremendous austerity measures, and this is going to be relevant to what I'm going to, you know, skirt this into, but 
they just wanted hope. That's really one of those chaos. You had the, the Munich Soviet and you had the, the violence following that. You had the decadence of Berlin while the rest of the country, people were starving. You had a country that was basically sort of going through a national nervous breakdown. That's been our cultural or an economic nervous breakdown. And what would happen was that this guy came along and this national socialist came along and he gave them hope. He gave them he gave them something that wasn't there before, a belief back in themselves. Now we all know that he was a maniac. And they they were so desperate they were led in to an even darker abyss after an initial honeymoon period. This tiptoe belief that if we do as they say, things will get better, is an appalling spell that's placed upon us. The, this idea that like, well, you know, the experts know best, and look, things are getting better. There's not as many unemployment. And they, they, they zoom and fly these statistics at you. Unemployment has stabilized. There are now no more decreases in unemployment. There are a thousand people back working this week. Suddenly that's giving you a shot of adrenaline, a shot of dopamine, and then the six o'clock news isn't as terrifying as it was for the last couple of years. And if you keep having these slightly improving feel good stories, couple it with coupling that with a a sort of a party like the nineteen thirty six Olympics which were held in Germany, you have people who will through this need to survive and not go back into the badness will do anything bureaucrats and politicians and the media tells them and that's literally how the Nazis came away with what they did it doesn't happen overnight and people it's just like I always say you know you're in a dysfunctional relationship with your society with your government. You, well, if you're in this dysfunctional relationship with a man or a woman, that didn't happen in one night. That had an initial honeymoon period. It built up and it moved along. And that a honeymoon period came to an end and then it became dysfunctional. Very dysfunctional often. And that's what happened in Nazi Germany. That's what happens in lots of countries. The honeymoon period is the hope that gets otherwise decent period people doing the most appalling things in order to ensure that they do not go back to the bad old days. Even if the bad old days were much better than the consequences of the good new days that are being promised. And while I was reading this book, although the scale is different, although the the culture is different, and although the the circumstances behind it that led to that, the consequences are different, I kept thinking about my country, Ireland, today. And I told you at the beginning of this show that this this politician said that our integration into European Union is the natural extension of our republic, our war of independence and our civil war that brought us to this point. And that sounds to me an awful lot like we have to find leaving strong living space we have to find a greater Reich. we have to expand and make germany bigger and we have to make other countries part of germany and we have to forget that germany is just within the confines of what was then the, the weimar republic but you know we also own the sudetenland we also have to expand into and it's the same thing but done in a different way and what that politician was saying that if you do what the EU tells you and the European Central Bank, if you do what the IMF tells you, in order to defeat these austerity measures again, what they're really saying is you must integrate into a greater Reich. Two years ago, somebody spray painted on a shopping center wall near where in the town near where I live, no Fort Reich. No anti-EU, no Fort Reich. And at the time, I laughed at it thinking it was a bit hysterical, but I don't know. I don't know, especially after reading this book, 
Lewis Hagen's Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Nine Lives Under the Nazis, because you see how these things creep into the culture, how they infect the subconscious minds of people, how they pollute consciousness. And it's just, it's like an infection. It's the same thing they say when you're, when you know a psychopath, you're involved with one, you're dealing with one, you just get the hell away because in time you will start acting like one. You'll become a proto-psychopath. That's why even if you have a good guy entering politics, politics, the, the psychopath is still pulling the strings and he or she will become infected. It's an infection. And the more I think about these infections, the more I think there's a spiritual dynamic to them. That they don't happen in the material world. Yes, the consequences appear in the material world. Yes, the happenstances, the facts, the realizations, the, you know, all the things that brought the people to these consequences that led to these appalling things, they may happen in the material world. But they don't originate in the material world because human beings and nature is not like this. It is almost like there's another form of consciousness that's on this planet. And I know I'm sounding like way out there, but this is this is the realization I'm coming to more and more. And it feeds off human misery. It feeds off our wars. It feeds off our fears. It feeds off our anxiety of losing our jobs. When the news report on the TV, 6 o'clock news, says that the economy has gone to crap. Something, somewhere, is harvesting this. There was a very good TV movie version of the Quatermass story starring John Mills, made in 1980. It was one of, the, one of the pivotal TV dramas for me as a kid growing up. And it revolved around, if anyone knows these Quatermass stories, it basically revolves around a British scientist who gets into, into nasty business with aliens and other forces. But it's, it's not like Doctor Who. It's much more dark, deep, and psychological. I'd, I'd ask people to check out all the Quatermass stuff. It's all online, or you get the DVDs. The film DVDs cheap enough, particularly Quaid Amast on the Pit. That's a phenomenal science fiction horror film. But anyway, this this nineteen eight seventy nine eighteen I think eighty seven seventy nine version with uh, John Mills, Quaid Amast, the scientist. This is, it begins with a Britain where everything has fallen apart. You have again we're back to the synchromysticism thing, and what's going on in Britain is. You know, you have gang violence, a breakdown in society, a general loss of humanity, a, a kind of a psychopathic wrecked culture. And then you have the mainstream who fills the TV show constantly with all kinds of rubbish, all kinds of like sex and silliness and not even erotica. We all you know, erotica is lovely, but this is page three titillation, stupid TV shows. And then on the other side of that, you have this group of people who've broken away called the planet people. And the planet people are like hippies, new age hippies. And what they do is they walk through the British countryside saying the word lay, and they're following ley lines. And they're following these ley lines to megalithic stone circles and other sites, sacred, what are called sacred sites like that. And then... A, a, a kind of a laser beam from space is fired and they're all harvested. Some or some energy outside the earth is feeding on the misery of the collapse in world society. And they do it by targeting the people who are the most innocent of all, the hippies, the lay people, following the ley lines, who you know that society is disgusting. And John Mills has lost his niece and he wants to find her. And that's, that, that, that metaphor and that film of these exterior beings or energy forces harvesting the misery and frustration of human existence is it, what I see all around me today, especially, like someone said to me the other day, okay, Thomas, what, what causes psychopaths? 
And I said, listen, love, I don't know. I, for all the years I've been looking at it, I don't know. But I'll tell you something, science knows even less. It's not in neurology. And if you want me to put my, my you know, put it out there, you know, I would just say, I actually believe it's a negative consciousness, a different form of consciousness that somehow gets into humans and infects them. And you read about the archons and the Gnostics, and you, there's all kinds of things. It's not just them and demons. And you do realize that a lot of that is just as close, especially some of the experiences I've had in recent years, which I know, you know, no scientist is going to tell me. It's like, oh, you know, it's worse even still some skeptic. You know, it's going, well, I'm sure there's a perfectly rational scientific explanation for that. No, 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 no. No motherfucker. What I saw with my own eyes and I experienced was beyond the realms of the five sense reality. And I wasn't on mushrooms. I was perfectly, perfectly lucid. I was walking at the back of my house and I saw something that was really quite astounding and quite terrifying. And I don't want to talk about it now because it's still pretty early, but it happened around the time I started talking about the Jimmy Savile stuff. And so there's something else going on. I'm not going to be some kind of guru and say I know exactly what it is, but there is something. And it's, it's not aliens on another planet. It's here on this earth here. It's in this reality with us. It's just tuned out and we can't see it. Is it a manifestation of us? Is it something we've created, a kind of a tulpa, a, a neuro, you know, a thought form that's come to life? And we, I don't know. And I'm very wary of people tell me that they do know. But I can tell you that there's some non-human interaction going on. Uh, you heard it from Thomas Sheridan, you've heard it from me. Finally say it on, on the radio that there is a different force of consciousness let's so we say some call it demonic some call it archons some call it you know succubus incubus the jinn call it what you want there's something to this i don't like getting bogged down in vernacular and absolute terminology and i don't like getting bogged down in dogmatism relating to these things because i believe that what you talk about and what you think is what you get this is why we have to be very careful. It's the archons. No, that's just a theory, a hypothesis, a suggestion. Don't say that's what it is. It's the reptilians. No, that's a theory. It's the same thing with the disclosure stuff. I truly believe. Now, I know you can create I, I'm my own work into like studying UFOs and stuff. I'll have someone on the show in a couple of weeks talking about this, that they're creating the human mind and consciousness. And they have been filling us with this idea of an alien invasion for the same reason. They're trying to get us to create a manifestation of an alien invasion, which a consciousness will change reality. It happened in the 1950s over Washington, D.C., during the height of the Cold War, where Cold War anxieties created these amazing lights that hovered over the Capitol building in New York. If the fear is right, the energy is right, the anxiety is right, you manifest these things. So be very careful of jumping on terminology and vernacular, because sometimes that's leading you astray. Just say, you know, think an unseen force, an unseen energy, whatever. But it does relate to the occult, because you look at the Nazis, and you look at their symbolism, and it was filled with magical sigils. It came from astrotheology. It was obsessed with communicating with spirits. Its insignia was, and its, its regalia was connected to direct energies. Every single German swastika banner had been dipped in the blood of the people who were killed in 19 music, in the first riots in the 19th, it was 33. And then every banner would be touched against that. To transpose the energy and then they used to put them at these nighttime torch lit rallies and people were spelled out and whatever put the nazis in there is now controlling the united states i'm not putting down americans i love america i love american people but whatever energy has been running down has left 
is now taking threat to your country. And that's why you are building drones. That's why you're being appalled. That's why your new government is being appalled to your own people. This is why Monsanto has taken over. We're not dealing with human beings. We're dealing with some kind of negative pathological force. And it doesn't matter if it's the, the psychopath in City Hall or the one in your bed or the bully at work. They're all, to me, from what I can tell, hardwired into this stuff. They are hardwired into it. They are interfaced into this. They're almost like ventriloquist dummies. And this, whatever this force is, is putting the hand inside them, their back, and talking and moving them in this reality. I know that's out there, but I'm not a scientist. I know that's out there, I'm not a neurosurgeon. I know that's out there, I'm not a psychiatrist, thank God. I know a lot about psychology, I know a lot about the brain, and I know enough to tell me that it's not in there, it's coming from somewhere else. And they, psychopaths, who were their Nazis, the European Central Bank, Monsanto, or the, the guy down the, down, the, down the street that steals your house when you're away and gaslights old ladies to take their helms off them, they're hardwired into that. So be very careful. Be very careful how you use terms. Be very careful how you think about things. Don't fall for this disclosure bullshit. That's one thing they're playing, disclosure. Some people are obsessed with this disclosure thing. It's like a fetish for them. We're going to get disclosure. Oh, oh, oh baby. Oh, oh. We're going to get disclosure. Oh, give it to me. Go disclosure, baby. Disclosure. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Stop it. Just stop it. Follow your instincts. Follow your own heart. Do not fall for these distractions they give us. Because they've always lied. You show me one thing. You know, for years I've been here. I was the one, classic one years ago was it? Uh, well, UFOs must be taken very seriously as aliens because former President Jimmy Carter wrote down an affidavit claiming he'd seen a UFO. Isn't it amazing how these people who they trust, you know, uh, I'm awake, I, I'm awake, I'm awake. I, I know politicians are all psychopaths. I'm awake. I don't like politicians. Yeah, but I trust every word they say about alien disclosure. Are you awake or are you sheeple 2.0? Think about that one. The next time you're sharing links all over Facebook. Oh, disclosure's coming. A, a Canadian politician said so. So he, he was a wanker before he started talking about disclosure and aliens. And now he's talking about aliens. He's not a wanker. You trust him every word he says. They're messing with us. 24 7 because they know what makes us thick and tick and they don't want us doing the one thing the one thing that rescues us that rescues us from this mess individuality self-determination freedom of will personal choice internalized actualized self-realization they want you waiting for the sky bunny, the spaceship fairy, the return of the Messiah. As long as you don't know or come to realize that the Messiah is already here and it's you. This is the next track. It's by Andy and Mick.
Apparently that was Mick. Well, I, was, I wanted to hear "Last Train" by Andy and Mick, which is like a poem. Which is, but that was pretty cool. I enjoyed that as well. We'll get the other song, La, uh, Andy and Mick, "Last Train" next week or some other time. But that was that was that was Andy and Mick, but mostly Mick. And the name of that track was La, "Last Terrorist." So uh, sorry about a slight mix up there. Uh, we'll we'll sort that out next some other time for you guys. So uh, I'm about to welcome on if she's there. The the maven of the Type Net One Network. Fight chick, are you there? I am, Thomas. Can you hear me? You're very you're very low. Hello. Hello. Hiya. Hi, Thomas. Hey. Hello. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. It's very kind of you to invite me on. Well, the reason why I'm inviting you on is because when the show ended last week, you and I had a little very interesting off air conversation about you know fasting and other things and i really like what you're saying and i didn't think it should be consigned to the nether regions of the electromagnetic spectrum rather it should be shared i hope you can remember what it was because i can't remember what i said <laughs> I, I was we were talking about uh, we were talking about that uh, I, I i said that i was going to go on the fast and you told me it was a really good idea and you were saying things like, uh, well, it would uh, you would really understand how beautiful food tastes after you've had the fast. Um, yeah. That was amazing. That was that was amazing to me because I had, I remember the oak and the eggs tasted gorgeous. Yeah. And the the lassie with the I could really really taste the pineapple. And we were talking about food porn, or I was telling you about food porn. How well yeah. when um, when I've done fasts before. Um, I end up watching television, um, f- uh, food programs on television, just to kind of see things and just imagine what they would taste like. And you see these chefs making these really delicious things. I think in in uh, this country we have a program called Master Chef, yeah. where some amateur, you know, really good amateur cooks are in competition against one another to become um, the Master Chef. Uh, clues in the title there. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I was, you know, I end up watching programs like this and just really enjoying them for the <laughs> for the food yeah. porn that they offer. Um, and I, I, I kind of, um, that's like when I'm on a fast, you know, and obviously kind of, you know, um, taking myself away from any kind of food or sense, you know, the sensation of food, the flavors and everything. And I think we really take for granted. So so many so much of our food that um, and so much of it as well is kind of slung with sugar and salt to enhance the flavors, monosodium glutamate and um, high fructose syrups to give it sugary content, um, and we actually lose the real flavor of food, the real sugars and the real salts in food, and that for me is just the best thing about doing a fast is when you finish. And you move back into eating food again because it just tastes so wonderful. And just the most simple food is absolutely delicious. <laughs> yeah, it's like you, you just just to change the tangent there, you triggered something else there. But it's a good point as well. You talk about the show like Master Chef. That's on just about everywhere. And they have uh, every country, even Ireland's own version of it, where they have like the the the, the people. Basically, food is turned into a competition. Yeah. It's not about nourishment. It's not about, you know, feeding oneself or one's family. 
it's not about the beauty of food. It turns it into a challenging situation, a sport, yeah. a competition. And I'm a firm believer that en- food has an energy that's inherent in it according to the the love that's put into it. Mm. You know, and so th- 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 to me, that there's a, there's a nutritious a le- a level of energy that's inherent with home cooking that you don't get in a, the best restaurant. And you certainly wouldn't get in a Gordon Ramsay restaurant and imagine where he's screaming at the other chef. <laughs> Absolutely. Food because... Does that energy go into that cooking? Yeah. And does that make does that make Gordon Ramsay's food ultimately dangerous? And then you have that guy Heston. I would Blumenthal, say so. Heston Blumenthal, who has produced a scientific, almost transhumanist version of food for his restaurant. That's why I have to say, God bless her, Nigella Laws, and I know that's food porn, but at least she sort of was like, was like a proper mother cooking. You got that kind of energy off her, even though it was it was kind of it was kind of sultry and stuff like that. She's, <laughs> yeah. she's easy on the eyes, but at least she was cooking for her family and things like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, it wasn't in a restaurant where it was all about money and stuff like that. So I actually do believe that energies are inherent within food. Like you can take a, a meal that's not particularly nutritious, but if you put enough love into it, it'll actually boost the nutrition. In the same way, you know, when people talk to plants, it's been shown that plants grow faster. Or, you know, and children who are unloved, they don't grow as quickly. I really do believe that. There's a lot to that. Mm. But what the fasting made me sort of, like you said, respect food in a different way. And did you did the food taste different when you actually began eating again? Yeah, like the the, the fried eggs, I was very aware of the oil. I used the, the vegetable oil I used to cook them in. Yeah. So I, that seemed to me that my normal amount of vegetable oil was too much. It seemed overpowering. Right. The the yolk of the egg was so much stronger tasting to me. Now I always eat organic eggs anyway. They have a nice rich oak. But it was really amazing. Did you put and a bit then, of salt on it? Yeah, yeah, I sea salt and I had a little bit of cracked pepper. Mm. Oh, I can remember the smell of the cracked pepper too. Mm-hmm. Much more <gasps> pepper, it's got a, it's a perfume, isn't it? It's such yeah, a lovely yeah. smell yeah, with grind pepper. Was, yeah, you could feel a real gas coming from it. Yeah, from the actual pepper, it was cracking in the in the in the thing, and and that was beautiful. And then also the even. But even, I was a bit cautious about eating because I thought, like, you know, I'd get myself sick because there was no lining on my stomach or something like that. But it didn't feel like that at all. Mm. It just felt lovely. And I didn't feel, I I was a little bit gassy afterwards. Mm. And I was a bit gassy during the fast as well. That was an interesting one. Even, like, three days into the fast, I was still kind of the odd burp now and again. I don't know where that was coming from. I know it was probably bacteria in my stomach was dying or something because it wasn't getting any food to uh, digest. Yeah, it depends how you were going about things as well because on long fasts you need to take something which will stimulate the gut to actually expel um, food through the body because what happens when you stop eating is the peristaltic movement actually ceases as well. So whatever's in there that you've eaten for your last supper is pretty much going to kind of, you know, first of all it's kind of running through the stomach and through the intestine and then it just kind of goes into slow motion because there's th- that that motion has, has ceased because you're not eating and digesting and swallowing and the enzymes aren't being produced and that whole thing isn't happening so the the whole body that whole system slows down and begins to um yeah just really slows down and so you you often have to take some kind of laxative that will stimulate the gut it's not good to take laxatives, obviously, but for a short period of time, in the course of doing a, a detox, it it's um, it, it helps, and they you know they're not going to damage you too much. Um, so um, and sea salt as well is a good laxative as well. If you drink like a pint of sea salt in, with two teaspoons of um, sea salt in a pint of water, that can really get the gut going as well. Um, and it also helps with your salt intake and your salt balance. Um, so that could possibly be what it was that your, your the food inside was um, not moving through enough and was beginning to kind of ferment and cause bloating and gassiness and that kind of thing. So a glass of salt water, sea salt water, would have salted that out? Well, first thing in the morning, two teaspoons of sea salt 
um, dissolved in a pint of water and glug that down the whole lot and that gets things moving through, yeah. But I always I, I always find that laxatives, I, I usually take a laxative of some sort as well. So how often would, like as part of a regular diet, how often would you take that glass of water, salt water? In, well, just generally in your regular yeah, life. Yeah. Is it a good idea to have it on a regular basis? Um, I would imagine in the summertime when you're sweating a lot, it would be yeah. useful um, because it will help that. But obviously don't put Saxa table salt in it. No. Um, you would have to really. use a, a really yeah. good quality, like a, a good quality mineral salt. Yeah. Um, so that you're, you're being remineralized. Well, we have we have one of the biggest salt mines in the world here, table salt mines in the world here, just up there in Northern Ireland, and it's a, an industrial operation. If people knew what table salt was, it's it's like diamond mining, isn't it? Uh, coal mining, yeah. The, 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 the trucks, there's like little literally highways into the side of the mountain. Yeah. And it's the same salt that they put, they, they use to grit the roads in winter. <laughs> it's the same stuff that go on your table in, the, in your table salt. <laughs> I mean, it's really, you know, it's amazing. Like, it's, it's, it's like, you back in the 70s, when I tell you this story, back in the 70s, during the final years of the Franco government in Spain, some, some petrochemical company in Spain, under that di- dictatorship, discovered that it could make a, a cheap substitute for olive oil from a petroleum, petroleum byproduct that was used in the manufacture of diesel. It was a stuff that they didn't use in diesel. And they discovered that they could sweeten and flavor it a certain way. They could produce, you know, quote-unquote olive oil for very poor Spanish people. And the Spanish people, you know, they cook everything in olive oil. Mm. And uh, they could they could use that in their cooking. And what happened was this olive oil was actually bought by the poorest Spanish families at the time in the 70s who used it to replace olive oil, which has been become expensive in Spain at that time because there's been a frost, a late frost, which has damaged the harvest. And olive oil had become very expensive. And what happened was it changed the, the epigenetics in the children and it pushed in. Have you ever heard that disease that causes children to age really fast? Yes. Yeah, and it was horrific. And we're talking about tens, not tens, but thousands of Spanish children who were like old people and they were like eight and nine. Their their biological clock was switched on, and this is like one of the, actually one of the events that actually led to the de- to the collapse of the Franco government, because you know basically because it was a dictatorship and it was run by big business, they could do whatever they want. A warning there for us, but it shows that what we put in our body doesn't only affect you know our, you know our physiology in terms of our you know our our digestion or in terms of you know our immune system, but actually can alter the very fabric of our DNA. Mm. And especially with what they're doing... Oh, can I just say, was it progeria? Was that the disease? Progeria, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Horrible. Um, yeah, dreadful. Poor little thing. But um, the the way food is being messed around with at the moment, like you say, on the one hand, we've we've got these food programs which are showing people making, you know, very elaborate things with food or even very simple things, doing, you know, just very homely cooking things um but th- that's all being shown on one side on the other side we've we've got food being messed with to the point where it, food is hardly recognizable and um we've got the codex um things coming along whereby they're taking all the vitamins out of food because they might have too many vitamins you know if if you've got uh, uh, apples and uh, bananas and grapes and things with too many vitamins in them if you're eating your five a day you might actually be ODing on vitamins so uh you that's know. just incredible <laughs> you, i know go, isn't it you go to these skeptic sites they don't believe that food actually even has vitamins these, <laughs> a lot of these hardcore skeptics in the bunkers only believe that food has calories they just see food in terms of a calorific intake yeah and, you know and, and use that's no it, they, don't, they yeah. don't see it they're absolutely off their rockers because yeah. where the hell do they think medicines came from? They were synthesized yeah. molecules that were inherent already within natural plants and fruits. And here are these same idiots now saying that food doesn't have vitamins in it or uh, that vitamins are no use. They're labeled as um, calories and fats, aren't they? Yeah. And so you have to cut down on your calories and your fats 
or if you cut down on the fat, then you'll get less. You know, it, it could equal less calories. Well, it's the pure materialistic, mechanistic view of the universe. It, Everything is quantified, measured, and weighed. Therefore, if food is a process, it has calories. The calories are burnt off in a sort of a the second law of thermodynamics. That energy always deteriorates. And then you had, like, during the 80s or 90s, you had the Atkins diet came out, which I did and was very successful for me and many other people who are very, you know, we have a lot of trouble with weight gain because of carbs. And yeah, yeah. I lost an awful lot of weight on that, and it worked great for me. And yeah. the thing was that I, 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 that after a while, any one diet makes you sick, you know, the kind of thing. Yeah. You don't, but, like, Atkins said that his diet, now this is what was wrong, even though the diet worked and it, it was proven, Atkins made the mistake of saying that the reason for this was that the, the, the science was off, it, it, you know, in terms of like what, what he was trying to say, that the, it was actually burning more calories in the body than the food was consuming. It turns out now that Atkins was wrong about that, but his diet still worked. But they never really said why his diet worked. His diet worked because I think what happened was you would stop eating food after a while on Atkins because you were kind of bored of just the type <laughs> of eating. So you would just stop eating. And you were sort of living off on much less food. And that was the real reason the diet worked. And it did, it pretty well did work. And the thing was, it did, I can remember how vilified that guy was during his life. When he died, the poor man slipped on, on the like, icy pavement in Manhattan <laughs> and, and banged his head on a fire hydrant and he died. They were apps, they were scientists in magazines and nutritionists were like literally dancing on his grave laughing, mm. saying that he was a big fatty who fell. And there were rumours that he died of a heart attack and things like and that. He was, he was, and he was, he was like 300 pounds overweight. And what happened was, in order to reduce the swelling in his brain, they had pumped him full of fluids in order to move his, you know, the lining of the brain away from the skull mm. in, order, in an attempt to try and save his life. And yet, they, so the, on, on the coroner's report, he was much more heavier than he should have been because he had been pumped full of fluids. Mm-hmm. And they, it was really wicked. And these, like, these, like, you know, hardcore reductionists, and particularly the nutritionists. And the nutritionists always try to like mark themselves as hippies, kind of thing. Like when I was growing up, anyway, you know, macrobiotics and all that stuff. Yeah. And some of them, it's just like the whole thing. Like a lot of vegetarians. I'm, I'm not putting down vegetarians. I, I know it works for some people, but a lot, a lot of, a lot of people I know that are like, are, like hardcore vegans and stuff. They lose their temper very easily and stuff like that. And they seem to be quite irrational. I know it's probably a stereotype, but that's just my experience. I'm not a big fan of veganism and stuff like that. It may work for some, it doesn't. I, I, I mean, I, to me, it seems like a very dodgy way to live your life. But then again, who knows what the right way is anyway. But there seems to that the hostility towards the man was shocking. You know, mm. and it seemed, it showed you how 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 glued in they are to their food pyramid. Do not mess with the food pyramid. Abs- I know, absolutely. <laughs> it's very odd, actually, the when you see that food pyramid, because I, I think they have like um, the things that you're meant to eat the most of at the bottom, don't they? It's, things like yeah, you know, it's really of bread it's really and rice. Yeah. <laughs> mm. The bulky things, bulk yourselves out. Don't fill yourself with things that are like really good for you and high in, you know, really good nutrients and minerals and all, and all that. No, don't fill yourself out with those. Just bulk yourself out with bread and pasta and that kind of thing, and then just take a small amount of nutrients. <laughs> like I remember the jogging craze back in the the, the early 80s, and uh, John Jane Fonda and all that stuff. Boost your carbs, you know. <laughs> yeah, Boost that was it. it. Yeah. Boost your carbs, girl. Shake that ass. You know, that kind of thing. And then yeah. they're all like, they're all, they're all, they're all like, they're all, they've all got mushy brains because there's no minerals in them. There's no uh, proteins or fats. Yeah. Completely. It's ridiculous. It, it, it is. It's all. If they if they're promoting one thing, then you can pretty much say that. Go the opposite. Do the opposite. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, they'll muddle it all up. They'll say things like, uh, "Oh, you know, a cup of coffee a day is really good for you," or "A glass of red wine a day is really good for you," or "A piece of chocolate a day is really good for you." Um, and they'll just muddle it all up with with everything. And yeah, I would say, you know, take all of those things or any of those things but just don't do it all the time and um, you know you have to be sensible with your diet and also just check yourself just check are you obsessed with food are you um, it has food taken over your life and the whole thought of food 
if uh, and you can check this by doing something like a detox and yeah. seeing how how much time you spend just thinking about oh my god I want to eat now or what am I going to do and you actually find yourself with a, a lot more time on your hands actually when you're not cooking all the time yeah that's absolutely true and it's great in summer because you're not eating the house up by putting the oven on yeah yeah and uh, you're not put making steam by boiling vegetables yeah. another one that's interesting you said you know don't become obsessed with food that also works in both ways not just you know the sort of like lavish banquets and yeah. treats, but also people who are very obsessive about their diet Absolutely. in terms of health food. You know, health. You know, it's just you were saying yeah. earlier. There, what you're saying that we're people who, you know, yeah, people who survive on like a few grains of rice and oh yeah, yeah, whatever. And you have, have to have a macrobiotic diet because that's what they ate in India. And, black, and look at them; they're, they're so peaceful. Building yeah. nuclear weapons. That, that's have, an obsession. Have the 15, other way, and having fifteen thousand guests at a wedding and, and a pimped up elephant. Mm. But, Woody Allen had that movie Sleeper. Remember that film Sleeper? Yeah. And he was a health food store owner, and he, yeah. he was transported into the future, and he That's found right. that everyone <laughs> discovered that eating steak and uh, drinking beer and smoking <laughs> cigarettes was the healthiest option. Yes, that was right. I remember that. Excellent. And the orgasmatron. The orgasmatron. <laughs> but the, um, what were we just saying there about, yeah, I often find that people who are a bit, too obsessed with food, with, with not having food, with kind of, um, uh, you know, just eating a few grains of rice and not actually eating much food, there tends to be, um, what shall we say, kind of, um, some kind, there, there are kind of issues going on there, that, like avoidance issues and, and things to do with not looking after yourself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but also the media makes people insecure and drives us all nuts. We're gaslighted constantly by the media. Well, this yeah, is, yeah. This is why Elvis ended up with, like, you know, a, a colon that had, like, basically a truck in it. Mm. And Karen Carpenter died of anorexia. Yeah. Yeah. But, but she she was completely, um, I, I, you know, I feel like that the whole anorexia thing and, and that kind of, it, it's because you're just made to feel so guilty about the whole world around you. Uh, yeah. And, and it's a, a kind of guilt thing, whereas... Um, people who are becoming obese are um, trying to perhaps push down, you know, just feeding all the time, feeding to to nurture, to nurture, to nurture, because you you you, you feel so shit about things, so you're constantly trying to nurture yourself. So there's the two two kind of ends of the the spectrum there. Yeah, you're and, fi- and you're filling a hole, you're filling a void. Yeah, and not, and not just a, a nutrition or a taste one. It could be a, a void in your in your soul, your personality. Yes, yeah. And often when you're on a detox, um, if providing that, you like say, you know, you're in, you eat normally, you don't have any kind of fatty diets that you're normally on. You're not a kind of fatty person. If you if you do, and then you go on to a a detox, um, this is another thing that doing a detox can highlight is just other things generally within your own personality it can highlight um you know a diff- different uh, parts of your own personality perhaps where you you know there are um you know you're using food to um actually not even using food to 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 do something but just the fact that you're not busy all the time with making food and the fact that you're actually digesting the remnants of the food that you put in your your body is actually beginning to work in a different way and the mind is working in a different way and so you you you, you become aware and and there are, there are other thoughts and parts of yourself that you're analyzing other than the the bits that you normally normally analyze which are to do with your digestion and the the, the um pulling apart of things and so often thinking can become a bit clearer but then there is the desperation as you come towards the end where you're really desperate just to kind of have some delicious flavors <laughs> again and that that abstinence is what makes it you know it, it's what makes it so good yes exactly Even, yeah for that reason alone it's worth doing yeah but of course if you take that abstinence too long then it becomes an obsession and it over and, yeah. and it becomes it, it it morphs into the um you know the wrong side and you yeah you get the kind of neurotic. Bad, neurotic obsession coming in, yeah. So yeah, you have to be able to do these things in a um, 
uh, what's the word in a, a, mature a, sen- way. a sensible and mature way yeah and not feel and, and also never do a, de- a detox thinking that you're doing it as a diet because they're not diets never do a detox to lose weight because chances are you'll more than likely gain a bit of weight afterwards because you initially lose weight but then when you start eating again you often overeat at the end, uh, when you finish a detox so you tend to put on a bit of weight then and also the body goes into um uh, what if it, it, it thinks it's um, being starved? It thinks that you're in a, um, a situation uh, like a um, oh a, a, a famine situation, and yeah, so yeah. The, the body the body goes into famine mode and starts working in a different way. So as soon as you start eating food again, then um, it it's going to pile pile on. The, it's going to hold on to it a lot more rather than you know just the natural process of in and out, in and out. So, yeah, you have to be careful when you're doing these things. And like you say, do them sensibly, maturely. Don't don't think that you're doing it to lose weight. Don't think you you know going to do it just because you want to fit into those nice size six disco pants or something. <laughs> um, but, but a lot to be gained from it if you do it properly. So the, the the bottom line is, you know, fasting and detoxing is a good thing. And, you know, go for it. Go for it. Because you might learn stuff about yourself. Yeah, you absolutely. Know. Absolutely. So thanks for that fight, Chick. And thanks for coming on. It was oh, thank nice you for inviting someone. me on. Well, it was, it was a pleasure having another voice on there, especially a female voice. And uh, really been enjoying all the shows, I must say. And I thought the comedy oh, bit you. earlier was very good. <laughs> oh, the Jeff Fox. Where is this? popped into my head. <laughs> I just popped into my head. I had to do it. But, uh, yeah, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. And that was Fight Chick there, sharing her womanly wisdom with us. She's a good cook, too. She made me dinner once. So, uh, we had a good show tonight, I think. I didn't know what I was going to do, what I was going to do, and I didn't know how it was going to end, but that was the philosophy of now, and that is the spirit of this show, and this is the spirit of the moment we should live in, www.thomasheridanarts.com, and I will see you this time next Sunday night. Take care of yourself, and as Dave Allen said, may your God or goddess or none at all go with you, and feck them if they can't take a joke. Good night.